job. And uh, Mark has helped us a couple of times before uh, with, with candidate forums, but tonight uh, is doing so for the first time as a reporter with NBC4. He covers D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Also a senior correspondent for WNEW Radio and the host of News Plus, a weekly public affairs program on DC 50 TV. Seagraves is an award-winning investigative reporter and talk show host. He has been covering local politics for more than 15 years. I went on to Google and tried to find out what you've been up to lately, and the only thing I saw was practically every public official in the District of Columbia had a complaint about Mark's, uh, Mark's uh, coverage, which apparently he's a, apparently he's a not, like the Committee 100, he's nonpartisan and, and offends all uh, when necessary. <laughs> Uh, for nearly 10 of those years, he was on... Rooted from the script I wrote. <laughs> there wasn't any... No, he didn't mention that. He was... For 10 of those years, he was on WTOP radio as host of the Ask the Governor program. Uh, so without further ado, I turn it over to Mark Seagraves for this evening's uh, 31st District Forum. Thanks very much, Annie. I'm getting old, i got to use my glasses. Thanks for coming out, and I apologize for being late. Uh, I wish I could say it was traffic, but the w one good thing about the shutdown is there really was no traffic getting here. Uh, so um, let me, uh, we're going to, I got the questions, excellent. Um, before we get to the candidate's opening remarks, uh, let me go over the guidelines, uh, the rules, uh, the do's and don'ts. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce the person who is the most important gentleman, the most important person in here, and that is our timekeeper tonight, Jim O'Connor. All right, so he has color-coded cards, two minutes, one minute, 20 seconds, and now I'm really in your face at this point. If we, if we get to this point, it's, you've, you, you've gone too far. So candidates, please, uh, Keep an eye on the time clock. Um, after the candidates uh, uh, give their opening statements, you can welcome them with a round of applause. But we had asked that during the questioning uh, that you don't applaud. Uh, you, you, you just hold that again until the end of the evening uh, so that we can get to as many questions as possible and so the candidates uh, can give you as much information because that's really the reason everybody, I believe, came here. One thing I like to do before we start to base, I got to tell you, I think this is the third or fourth year I've been here. This is the biggest crowd I've seen uh, for one of these, so well done, you guys. How many people here right now are undecided as to how they're going to vote in this race? <laughs> All right, well, target, target those four. <laughs> they, the rest of you are excused, actually, if, if you wanted to make some room up here. Uh, the questions here were, uh, as uh, Denny was telling you earlier, uh, were compiled by a panel uh, with the Prince William Committee of 100. Uh, 100. They cover a range of issues that will be uh, affecting or facing the General Assembly uh, that one of these gentlemen will uh, have to deal with. So, uh, with that said, uh, does anybody know, did we flip a coin, do we know who's going first? All right, all right, Mr. McPike. All right, so, um, let me do this. I will... Uh, I have uh, introductions here for each of you, so I will uh, introduce uh, Mr. McPike. Jeremy McPike was born and raised in Prince William County. He and his wife Sharon live in Dale City with her three daughters. For over a decade, Jeremy has served as a volunteer firefighter and EMT with Dale City Volunteer Fire Department. For his years of dedicated service, he's been honored with life membership with the fire department. He helped found the Dale City Volunteer Fire Department Foundation, which helps to fund public safety initiatives in our area. For the past 12 years, he's worked for the City of Alexandria, using his experience in construction management to make sure public building projects come in on time and on budget. He currently serves as Director of General Services, where he leads a department of 67. Ladies and gentlemen, the Democratic candidate, Jerry Mc Jeremy McPike. Actually, let me use that mic if you don't mind. Timekeeper, am I still okay? You are. All right. How's the sound in back? 
Well, first, I'd like to thank the Committee of 100 for hosting the debate. It's important we get a chance to talk about the issues. Thank you to my supporters who are here tonight, and especially to my family and to my best friend of 23 years, my wife, Sharon. Give a clap out. We're allowed for that, right? You know, I, I made the decision to enter this race because Scott Lingfelter is really no longer focusing on the issues that are important. As an example, Scott's legislation this year, he pays through House Bill 2223 which is a conspiracy theory that the United Nations is trying to take over Virginia. And then, in February, Scott in February supported a bill that would have Virginia print its own money. And then, and if that wasn't enough, Scott in 2012 supported legislation that severely limit a woman's access to birth control. The government has no place in the bedroom, folks. Scott's priorities are wrong for the district and wrong for Virginia. And they're distracting from the serious issues that our representatives were sit, sent to Richmond to deal with. And what are those important issues? Transportation. I supported Republican Governor Bob McDonald's transportation plan, along with Lieutenant Governor Bill Bowling and House Speaker Bill Howell. They recognized the critical state of our failed transportation system and took action. I'm a 995 commuter myself. I commute an hour each way to working back in morning and night. Mr. Lingenfelter, on the other hand, took every opportunity to vote down one of the most important pieces of legislation in the last 25 years, the Bipartisan Transportation Bill. Our area is an economic engine for the state. If you cut off the fuel to the economy, the engine dies. That's why Mr. Lingenfelter received the worst score of 52% from the Prince William Chamber of Commerce. That's an F under any grading system. On education, let's talk about this. I've got three girls in public schools here. We must reform our standard of learning. We've got to allow our teachers to teach and not just teach to a test. Mr. Lingenfelter has attempted to gut public education repeatedly, putting our children's future in jeopardy. Last year, Mr. Lingenfelter got a 0% rating from the Virginia Education Association. Education is an investment, not an expense. I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Virginia Education Association. Now, I want to be clear. I'm a fiscal conservative. I've made tough choices in government, balancing my own department's budget, and cutting where necessary to make sure it gets where investment is needed. What concerns me most is the law, uh, loss of the art of compromise, and we've seen it tremendously this week in Washington. I'm in this race to make sure we don't get, like Washington, constant gridlock, not addressing the issues that are important to the people, and not getting sidetracked by the extreme issues so we can focus on the issues that are important to our families. As a husband, as a father of three, as a firefighter, I've experienced many of the important issues facing our community. Growing up, I was taught to leave it better than we found it. And as your delegate, that is what I intend to do. Thank you. The Republican in the race is Delegate Scott Lingenfelter. He attended Virginia Military Institute and a UVA. Uh, he was a colonel in the United States Army where he retired after 28 years of service. He was first elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in 2001. He's a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee and a member of the Education Committee and chairman of the Militia, Police and Public Safety Committee. Delegate Lingenfelter, I apologize, sir, in advance, is I was 12 before I could <laughs> I appreciate that. It is, uh, is married to former Shelley Glick of Bridgewater, Virginia. They have three children, Amy, John, and Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, the Republican candidate for this seat, Delegate Scott Lingenfelter. I, I, think, I think this is on, is it not? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, after that introduction, I feel so bad about myself, maybe I should just quit the race. Um, you know, folks, this is a time of great contrast in the country. I, uh, I served the country for 28 years as a soldier, and I have never seen the turmoil and the disruption that we see in this country today. Look at the complete dysfunction of Washington, D.C., the Congress and the White House. We're all looking for leaders. 
they don't seem to be present. You know what I like to say to folks? What a difference 90 miles makes. You know, this January, we will go to Richmond. We will consider probably 3,000 bills. Probably 1,500 of them or so will get to the floor of the House. They'll go through a very robust committee system. All the bills will be heard. Not all of them will be agreed to. And we'll do a biennium budget. I sit on the Appropriations Committee. We'll do a responsible, balanced budget as our Constitution requires. We'll get the work done. We'll pass the legislation, we'll get the bills done, we'll have our debates. We will not always agree on the approach. Folks, that's called democracy. But we will get the work done, and we will focus on Virginia's core responsibilities. I take that work very, very seriously. I don't go down to Richmond and vote for something just because I'm told to vote for it. I apply my own experience and my understanding of what I believe is best for my community and the citizens and the taxpayers. Folks, the money that you send to Richmond is your money. It's not the government's money. It belongs to you. And we have to be fiscally responsible and at a time when families are struggling and small businesses are struggling, raising taxes is not a good idea. And that's why I took a principal position against it, even, then, even when the governor called me and asked me personally to vote for the bill. I had to consider people who are struggling to make ends meet. Folks, at the end of the day, it's not about accusations. It's not about I got you's. It's not about political talking points. It's about doing the right thing. Finally, I'd like to say I'm very happy my wife of 33 years is here, Shelley Lingenfelder, and she is a kindergarten teacher in Prince William County and my educational advisor. <laughs> All right, thank you, gentlemen. Has it been decided who goes first in questioning? It'll be you, sir. How is that an executive decision? All right, again, the, the questions have been uh, compiled by uh, a committee with, um, uh, within the committee. And so uh, here we go. This is the first uh, question. It is on economy and jobs will be the topic here. What legislation would you support that would attract industry to Prince William County? Delliot? Well, it's a, it's a very good question, and when, is this on? Yeah. Is it you're doing okay? It's a very good question, and I think that uh, when you look at what the General Assembly has been doing, we've been quite good. How many of you get Forbes magazine? How many of you heard that Forbes magazine rated Virginia the number one state within which to do business in the United States of America? How about it? Yeah, you can applaud that. You can applaud that. That didn't happen by magic. That happened by a number of things coming together. The General Assembly, working with the Senate of Virginia and with Bob McDonnell, I think has done a wonderful job in attracting businesses to Virginia. Don't believe it? Look how many businesses are leaving Maryland and coming to Virginia. Why are they coming to Virginia? Because they're not worried about big labor. We're a right-to-work state. And they know if they come here, more money goes to the bottom line so they can grow their businesses, they can hire more people and create wealth and opportunity and prosperity for Virginia. That's a good thing. The second piece is we have low taxes. And that's a good thing here in Virginia as well. Businesses want some predictability in this. Unfortunately, the system we have now has sales taxes at 5.5 or 5.3 percent in some localities, 6 percent in other localities. Our tax system is a wreck. And it needs to be reformed top to bottom. And we really need to get at that. In the meantime, though, I would tell you, businesses have given us a grade here in Virginia. And what they're saying is, we want to come to Virginia. We want to locate here. What I want to work on in the future 
in particular is how you bring light manufacturing to the Commonwealth. This is a vital area. We're never going to get, you know, General Motors to leave Detroit or whatever, but there's light, uh, uh, light manufacturing. I think we can reach out to them. We should, and they'll produce great jobs and prosperity for Virginia. So that's an area that I'm very, very interested in working in. Mr. McPike. This is one of the, the most critical issues, but first let me start. March of this year, Republican Governor Bob McDonald stated that Virginia has slipped from number one down to number five, and the reason is because of the failed state of our transportation infrastructure. He had the courage, along with other legislators, to step up to the plate. Now, I'm sure some would call them rhinos, a Republican in name only. I call it leadership, and that's bipartisan to recognize the deficit at the table and what it means to Virginia's future. They had the courage to step up and say, yes, we have a transportation issue. Our family's commuting up and down 95 and how we're choking off our economy, that's a problem. And so what's changed between this spring and now? We have a bipartisan transportation bill. We've made the right choices as a Virginia. Scott voted. small businesses, here's what I want to focus on. We've got small businesses, we've got a great source here with Quantico, we've got high-tech IT jobs, and we've got innovation at George Mason University. We've got a hub in the West and the hub in the East. We need to start to focusing on building off of those assets and resources. We've got great uh, human capital here, we've got to use it to build jobs closer to home. One of the things we can look at is looking at an exemption for b poll tax for small businesses starting up in their first three years. The first three years is one of the most important times of a small business. That's what I'm bringing forward to make sure we can invest and make sure our small businesses and our entrepreneurs have the opportunity, especially in these times when those who want to break out and start their business can do exactly that. Thank you. Our next question is a health care question. Uh, Mr. McPike will let you go first uh, this round. Do you favor Medicaid expansion? Mr. McPike. Thank you. Healthcare and Medicaid expansion specifically, you may, many have heard this, um, is tremendously important. It has the opportunity to expand 400,000 Virginians Medicaid. 400,000 Virginians get an opportunity here. It will also estimated to create 30,000 jobs with our money, with our money. It's estimated that it's $21 billion over the next seven years, that's our money that we hear others rejecting, which means that money, our money, is going around the nation and not back to Virginia. Folks, I want to make sure we get our tax dollars back here working for us. Now, it has a personal place in many for me. And my wife, Sharon, is a, actually four years ago today, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I know the tough choices we would have to make had we not had insurance. There are a lot of hardworking families that are doing the right thing that can't make ends meet. Going through those financial choices is, is not an easy one. We need to make sure that our Virginians have access and don't have to face financial ruin over difficult financial decisions. We've got to make sure we, got, we have our tax dollars coming back to Virginia. They're our dollars. They should be working for you. And Delegate Lingenfelder, Medicaid expansion? Very concerned about Medicaid expansion as a member of the House Appropriations Committee. We've looked at the numbers, and we are talking about potentially hundreds of millions of dollars here in Virginia that are currently unprogrammed for this. And Jeremy says, well, you know, we're going to get all this federal money as if it's free. Folks, I agree with P.J. O'Rourke who said that if you think health care is expensive now, wait till it's free. The affordable care law is rapidly going to become the unaffordable care law. And I am very concerned about it. Let me tell you what needs to happen. 
We need real reform. There are billions of dollars, folks, billions of dollars in Medicaid fraud in the United States today. We don't even sell health insurance across state lines. Now, some of the aspects of the Obamacare bill made sense, and most people support it. The notion of if you want to keep your kid on your policy, fine. The preconditions piece, good idea. But I can tell you now that there are real things that need to be done to reform health care. And I got to tell you, nobody's talking about it, but the number one thing in my judgment is tort reform. You have doctors, nurses, hospitals basically paying a ransom to lawyers. And I'm sorry to the lawyers in the room. Have a nice evening. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is we need tort reform in this country or you're not going to have health care reform. When I go back to Richmond, that is an area that I intend to continue to work in. Worked in it last year. But I can tell you this. I've had two hip replacements and I have successfully conquered prostate cancer. And I'm glad that I made the choices that were best for me and my health care and not the government. Uh, we're going to hold our applause. Remember, we all agreed to hold our applause. Uh, had I shown up on time and been here for rehearsal, I would have known that the delegates are also entitled to a one-minute rebuttal after each question. And so we're going to implement the rebuttal uh, minute right now. Uh, so, Mr. Pike, uh, a minute on uh, tort reform? Or? Thank you. Well, a, qu a quick minute on, frankly, what those reforms are and what they mean. Okay, we've got our health at stake and the reforms. Let's talk about reforms. One of the things that we've got to be careful of, if you talk to doctors and doctors' offices, is the level of administrative detail to do it. We've certainly got to do it, but we've got to focus on a system that is patient-centric, and that's the key to successful health care. It's too choppy right now. We've got to get back to the basics of focusing on the delivery of service. And we've got a, a lot of organizations across Virginia that have been working through that for years, and Republicans and Democrats support reform, but we've got to make sure we've got our tax dollars working for us. That's what I'll push for is to make sure we've got the best system and the system that's working our tax dollars for us here. Thank you. Uh, Delegate, you get a minute, but I believe you want to actually go back to transportation I with a minute. I do. I would have looked forward to a slight rebuttal there. When you look at legislation as a legislator, you have to look at all of the legislation and you have to ask yourself, what are the unintended consequences? I want to share a few things with you why I voted against the governor's transportation plan. First of all, it increases taxes. I already spoke in my opening about what I believe is not helpful in an economy, which who thinks the economy is robust? Nobody. We are in a sluggish economy, and the last thing we need to do is be raising taxes. We have created two tax levels uniformly in Virginia. We have maintained the same sales tax across Virginia until this year. And now we have 5.3 for some and 6% for others. I didn't agree with that. We raised the automobile sales tax in, from 3% to 1.15%. We unfairly target Prince William with higher taxes, with real estate recordation taxes. Sales tax is a 20% increase on Prince William of, when you go to 6%. The real estate tax, that's a 150% increase for our community. And I believe, and most importantly, this bill had $10 million in it to advance this Time. bypass, and I do not support this 234 bypass. All right, we're going to pay attention to the timekeeper and to the no applause rules from that one corner of the room. Uh, Mr. McPike, you'd like your minute on transportation, and then we'll be all caught up and we'll move forward. Thank you. Well, we talk about unintended consequences. Scott Lingenfelter voted for the bill in 2008 that gave the Commonwealth Transportation Board the authority to push down the bipartisan, I'm sorry, the bi, the bi county parkway that is on the table. So he's voted for legislation that is overriding your local authority on road issues. So yes, I agree, there are some unintended consequences. But the meat of the issue at the table is whether or not we're going to continue to feed the engine of our economy or whether we're going to choke it off. That's what's at stake. This means our jobs. The federal government is scaling back. This area has got to begin to retool. And we've got to be able to move people, goods, and services. We cannot take yet another decade of 
watching Richmond send a billion dollars for a 460 bypass, a road to nowhere, yeah, a billion dollars, versus having that billion dollars here to make sure we invest in our HOV lanes instead of trading into a foreign corporation for hot lanes. Now you got a toll. We've paid for the roads once. Now you're going to pay for them again for the next 75 years. It's not the right mindset. Okay, on to our next topic, and uh, we'll hear first from uh, Delegate Lingenfelter. Uh, the topic is environment and energy, and the question is, what is your position on uranium and coal mining in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Delegate? Well, first of all, on the uranium piece, I think that is a very, very important decision, and we have to be very careful with it. I don't know how many of you, how many of you followed that discussion very carefully, I mean closely, okay then you know that the local community in Southside Virginia is very concerned about the impact that uranium mining may have on their community. And so I think it's awfully important that two criteria be met, a minimum of two criteria. One, can it be done safely? And two, does it have the support of that local community? I think that's vitally important. On the coal industry in Virginia, folks, the Obama administration has destroyed the coal industry in Virginia. You know, when I was campaigning for lieutenant governor, I spent a lot of time down in southwest Virginia. I can't tell you the expression on the faces of people down there who are truly frightened for their future. They have no other place to go. Retraining is going to be extraordinarily difficult for them. And this, this administration has one of the most anti-energy policies I've ever seen. Look. We need to quit picking on the coal industry, allow Virginia to, to explore for natural gas off of Virginia's coastline, and that is the key, to allow us to exploit our own resources, but certainly not to have such an anti-coal policy that you are destroying millions of jobs. And folks, those jobs go all the way to Tidewater where that coal is actually put on ships and sent around the world as well. Mr. McPike. Thank you. Uranium and coal are vitally important. Let's start with the uranium. First off, how many of you know that in 1982 when the moratorium was put in place, there are 16 uranium mining leases in Falkir County that impact this watershed right here? Yeah. So there are 16 uranium mining leases from 1982. That's what's at stake. And guess what? The watershed, it travels from Fauquier right through Prince William and into the Occoquan Reservoir. I don't support uranium mining. I'm not willing to risk in the climates that we have an impact to our watershed, which impacts our entire D.C. region. We've got too much at stake and too much for our business and our families to risk that. I don't support it. Now, on coal. I traveled the state last year with the Sorensen Institute at UVA, a bipartisan program for political leaders. And one of my most memorable trips was to Southwest, Southwest Virginia and to a coal mine. And we went down to a mile down at the head of a seam and watched coal extracted. And the folks there are hardworking and they care about their community. And we need to make sure we have a means to clean up our energy plants and coal-fired plants, but we still need jobs. And we were at a coal cleaning plant that day. And there's important issues at stake for Virginia families and Virginia jobs. And we need to be supportive of this. Delegate, one minute rebuttal. The proof is in the pudding. How many are happy with the notion that we are dependent on foreign oil in America. Yet we can't get this president and this Congress to agree to allow Virginia to explore off of our own coastlines. We can't even get the Keystone pipeline built in this country, which would create hundreds of thousands of jobs around America. Folks, we've got to end the insanity and elect people who will have a legitimate America first energy policy. We don't have that today. 
Uh, Mr. McPike, your rebuttal, and if you could include, you didn't uh, address his comments on natural gas exploration offshore. If you could uh, talk about that. Too. Absolutely. I've been on record uh, long ago earlier this year as, uh, in favor of, of offshore drilling if we can meet the test that it does not impede our Navy, number one, and it does not import our most vital shipping needs. We've got one of the deep, we have the deepest port on the East Coast. This is a vital economic engine. We need not infract upon that. But if we've got the opportunity and the regulations are set, we should absolutely explore the opportunity to make sure we've got the energy resources we need. Now, I actually didn't hear whether or not he supported uranium mining or not. But I can again tell you, I don't support it. We've got too much at stake here. I won't support it, and I will support it. I'm not running for Congress. I'm running to be your local delegate. So that's a different discussion on a federal level. We need to support Virginia families here with what's at stake. We need to be supportive of our industries across this entire area, as well as our ports. And that's right. We've got a tremendous asset with the Virginia Port Authority. We've got new RFID check technology that from coal and our shipments from around the state is shipping out to export and import. We've got a tremendous asset there that we need to continue to support. Our next topic is public safety. And I believe we go one, two, one, two, we go to Mr. McPike first this time. And the question is, what remedies would you propose that would allow victims of financial exploitation to recover financial losses? Mr. McPike. Well, thank you. Now, I think we all experienced the downturn in the foreclosure crisis, right? And we saw a federal government settlement. And Virginia got $65 million back on the table, supposedly to help Virginia families. Scott actually voted to send that $65 million to Southwest Virginia to a waste treatment plant instead of sending it back. Stuff like this, if there are settlements on the table, we need to make sure they get back to the families that they were intended to get. As your legislator, I will make sure that your dollars get back to you. That's key in these sort of settlements. We've got important issues at the table. During the foreclosure crisis, I worked to make sure that we get foreclosures off the street and worked with a nonprofit coalition in Prince William and got grants. We were able to buy a dozen homes to fix them up and get them back into working families. We need to engage and we need a delegate that is engaged in the community on the issues that are important. There's too much at stake. We need to protect our consumers. We need to protect our citizens and hold those responsible accountable for their actions. As your delegate, I will fight for those. Delegate Lingenfelter? Absolutely. This is on public safety. Uh, what remedies would you propose that would allow victims of financial exploitation to recover their financial losses? Let me, let me ask a clarifying question, if I could. Are you talking about those people that are... You act like I wrote the question, well, so. I, I, well, I, I think it needs to be... I think we need a clarity on this, because the truth of the matter is, I, I heard Jeremy talking about a subject that sounded like it was coming out of left field. Uh, and Jeremy, you can say anything you want to about me, but you don't have to make stuff up. The truth of the matter is I've been working very hard in this community to help families that have, been, that have lost their homes get their home situation back in order. And I think if you talk to some of these community activists out here, they'll tell you that's exactly the point. So if you want to say stuff, go ahead and say it, but it ought to be true. Now, the other piece that I would say to you is there is a financial exploitation piece associated with those who take advantage of folks who are trying to buy materials after hurricanes and natural disasters. I think, I think that's probably closer to the question that, that was being asked. And the, and the truth of the matter, we've been very fortunate this year, haven't had any hurricanes, uh, which I'm very glad to see. But the truth of the matter is, we've passed legislation that in fact does punish people who deliberately exploit folks who are trying to get out from under a natural disaster and people are trying to jack up the prices and hurt people. That's just wrong. And so I'm proud to have voted for that bill, and I will continue to support measures that make sense. At the same time, we have a marketplace, and we have to allow that marketplace to work. But we shouldn't allow people to be exploited when they've been kicked and they're down. That's the time when we're supposed to be particularly fair. And I'm proud to say as chairman of Militia Police and Public Safety that I take a very keen interest in this. Thank you very much. Mr. McPike. Thank you. You know, as a firefighter, 
over the last 15 years, especially during the foreclosure crisis, I saw the clear evidence in the homes, and we all saw it in tall grass and the areas around us. There could have been one more important thing over the last five years than having a legislator truly engaged in the issues. Not just last year, but five years ago, in the height of the issues that were facing us with the federal government. So, Scott, yes, the vote's on the record. You can't run from the record. I'm sorry. It is what it is. I was involved in trying to get these foreclosed homes fixed up and back to working families. That helps our home values. That helps us to be able to refinance the basic pocketbook issues that impact our families. That's what's important. That's what's important, and that's what's at stake. You got a choice here. Who to rehire or who to hire. That's what this is about. My pledge is to be involved and engaged in this community on every issue that impacts families, period. Delegate? Well, I guess, Jeremy, you were too tied up with building a police building in Alexandria a couple of years ago when I was standing in front of the Appropriations Committee shoulder to shoulder with SALT, helping them get an appropriation to deal with the mortgage crisis here, particularly people who have been taken advantage of. And so you can go and find whatever obscure vote you want, but the proof is in the pudding. And I would invite you to go see the SALT leaders. And you ask them if I didn't stand shoulder to shoulder with them. And I think what they would tell you, Jeremy, is that I did. And I was proud of it. I think Rich Anderson and I both went to a community-wide meeting. A thousand people there, Jeremy. I don't recall seeing you there. But I was there, and Rich was there, and we were standing for the people who were in harm's way and had their lives turned upside down. And so, folks, words are one thing, but where you stand is another. And I stood with a command community that was hurting, and I'm proud that I did. Our next question is on the topic of taxes. Uh, Delegate, you'll go first on this one. Under what circumstances, if any, would you support raising taxes? I think that if you do legitimate tax reform, legitimate tax reform, and bring our taxes from the 19th century into the 21st century, you're going to see more revenues. That's what's going to happen. If you look at the tax system in the Commonwealth of Virginia today, we have at one level, the state level, income taxes, sales taxes, corporate taxes, recordation taxes, all kinds of different taxes, and they are pretty much geared to income and sales. In other words, the way businesses operate. But if you look at localities, those localities have some real problems because most of their taxes are associated with things that are confiscatory. That is to say, your home, your, your, your automobile, uh, your business inventory, property. And these localities don't have a lot of flexibility to deal with their own needs. We need a comprehensive approach to tax reform in Virginia. And you can't just do it at the state level. You're going to have to bring in the localities, you're going to have to get everybody at the table, and you're going to have to bring that tax system into the 21st century. I would tell you now, and I've looked at it every way you can, if you do legitimate tax reform and you bring taxes and update them into the 21st century, you will see more revenues derive from those taxes. And Mark, a lot of people will say, well, that's a tax hike. What I say back is it's important to understand that if you tune the engine and it works better for you, you're going to have higher revenues. But you know what else? You're going to have downward pressure on people who want to raise rates all the time. And that's why I oppose hiking tax rates. Mr. McPike. Thank you. I'm not sure I heard the, the answer to Mr. Lingenfeld or whether or not he had raised taxes or not. I know he signed the no tax pledge. You know, I'm a fiscal conservative, but I think we also need to dedicate ourselves to making choices based on the information we have in front of us. It's meaningful. It means it makes a difference to our families. You know, the interesting thing is how Virginia state government has balanced this budget over the last few years. And I have to say, I've seen it in local government, because you know what? The this, this state had the oddest thing I've ever seen, and it's how they've been cooking the books. 
They had the aid to localities program. So get this, they remanded your tax dollars and you sent millions of your dollars down to Richmond. That's how they met the balanced budget. Okay? So what happens in return? Your local tax dollars, that's right, all of your local tax dollars, guess what? You got it. Went up. So the state's got a very interesting way of balancing their interest in order to claim that they didn't raise taxes. As your delegate, I'm going to be upfront and honest with you. What choices we have on the table and what choices we have to make. If we take our top priorities and list them down, and I've done many budgets over the last decade, and you get to the bottom of the list, you got to start to ask choices. Should government be doing it? Is there an opportunity to partner with a nonprofit? Or should we be doing it at all? And I think those are the responsible choices we have to make. And then we have to own it. As a representative of a community, we then have to own that choice and bring it back to you and discuss the real impacts. Right? That's what representative government's all about. Is to bring back those choices, those discussions, but also figure out those partnerships. There's so many opportunities to partner with our nonprofits and communities. I've been involved in many non nonprofits and, and public private partnerships in the region that are value, they're value added, and we can use those to make sure we leverage the services we need in those tough times. And I'm willing to make those hard choices. I am a fiscal conservative, but I'm willing to also take the heat for the choices and investments we make together. Uh, thank you. In the rebuttals, I, I'm not sure that I heard the answer from either candidate here to, to the I, actual me, question there. So if in a yes or no, in your rebuttals, if each of you could address a question, right. would you raise taxes? Would you take the no tax pledge? No, and, no and, I'm not going to raise taxes. And you know, it's interesting, Jeremy, you say you're a fiscal conservative. Well, I'm holding here in my former nicotine sane fingers, as Russell and Bill like to say, um, a report. And it says that Jeremy McPipe, received $7,500 from a little organization called Democracy for America. Now, who runs Democracy for America? None other than that great conservative icon, Howard Dean. The first guy who stepped up to support Jeremy McPike was one of the most liberal people in the nation. And he doesn't like Obamacare either. He thinks it's not liberal enough. He wants a full takeover of the health care system by the federal government. So, Jeremy, I appreciate the comment about conservatism, but sometimes you say things you don't really mean. Mr. McPike. Thank you. No, I think he answered the question, uh, which, is, which is he would not raise taxes, right? Mr. Lingenfelter. Got it right. All right. Promises made, promises kept. Actually, he did raise taxes, though he raised taxes on your local tax dollars. As I just said, they played the shell game on us, and they had the oddest thing, the locality aid to the state. And they remanded your local tax dollars and sent it right back up. It's a shell game, folks. It's politicians playing the game. It's got to stop. We've got to make real choices and real issues. Now, if Scott wants to talk about taking money and ethics, I think there's a lot on the table here. You know, Scott, as a legislator, is taking $20,000 in gifts. It's time we change the climate and the culture in Washington, and it's in Richmond now as well. Taking gifts for your public service does not add up to service. I'm sorry, it doesn't. We've got to reform the culture. We've seen the scandal involving Cuccinelli as well as Bob McDonald. We've got to change the climate, folks. It is undermining the public trust. That's going to be the number one thing as your legislator to bring to the table is ethics reform. We've got to do it. Easy. <laughs> Our next topic now is education. And uh, the question is, uh, and uh, we will go to uh, Delegate Lingenfelter first on this one. And, uh, no, we go over here to Mr. McPike. Thank you. Uh, the question is, do you support in-state tuition? at Commonwealth colleges for undocumented students who have graduated from Virginia high schools. Mr. McPike. Thank you. You know, this is, you hear a lot in the media, and you hear a lot of passionate arguments about this. But you know what? As a firefighter, the last 15 years, being at the doors and talking to people, the kids we're talking about, they grew up here.
we don't need to penalize these kids for something their parents did. We've invested our dollars educating them. Most of them know English better than any other language. They're more American, in fact, more appreciative many times than what we have. It's time we make sure that the American dream is also extended to those kids. It's important. It's vitally important. They're also part of our future. We're a nation of immigrants. While we certainly have to deal with immigration reform at a national level, you know, Virginia does not have borders with a foreign country. This is a federal issue. It's got real impact and real issues. But for those who are here, we've got to make sure that they've got the right opportunity to help build in our economy. They are working. They are paying taxes. They've been in our schools. They've been in our neighborhoods. they played on our baseball teams and our soccer leagues. They are a part of our community. And we need to make sure they have a future here in Virginia. Delegate Lingenfelser. I want to take a point of personal privilege here because I take my integrity very seriously. I don't like what I've seen happen in Virginia in the last year with some of the things that we've seen revelations about gifts. But Jeremy McPike, you know these things because I reported them and I obeyed the law. Now I would tell you something. The speaker called me up about five weeks or five months ago, I guess, and told me that he wanted me to help with an ethics reform process here in Virginia. Let me tell you why he did that. You see this little document? It's called a legislator's guide for conflicts of interest and rules of conduct. In 2007, before all the fluff you hear now, I went to legislative services and said, we need this. We need clear guidelines so people understand what their responsibility is. And in 2009, that document was produced. And it was produced because of my leadership. I would tell you, my, my good name and my honor is very important. You know, Jeremy, when life is done and all the debates are finished, and all the bills have been put away in the bill books, and all the speeches have been made, people are going to remember one thing about you, Jeremy. They're going to remember how you treated people. And I think it's vitally important that we be very careful what we say about people's honor and integrity before we suggest that somehow they don't have any. And by the way, you can have my copy. Mr. McPike, you know, th that's a part of this sort of issue and context here in Richmond. It creates a context of excuse. And in fact, Scott said in the, the Fox Dem Times Democrat last week that, you know, my trip to Paris, my luxury trip to Paris paid for by your Virginia uranium, it was okay because the Democrats did it too. But that's the problem. People don't see, when they're there, that the climate around them is undermining the public trust. Documented or not, it undermines the public trust. It just does. It's the basic. Okay? We've got to reform and make real reforms, not a guidance document, but real legislative reform that takes the gifts out of the picture. We pay our delegates a per diem. We pay them money to, to get food and lodging already with your tax dollars. We don't need fancy steak dinners and NFL pro box seats that they've been getting. Okay, the police and firemen and teachers that I know, they don't get that for the service, for being public service, neither should your legislator. It's a permissible atmosphere of permissive, permissive degradation of our public trust. That's what's at stake. So, it is meaningful. We need to change. We've got to bring it. First thing in January, make sure it's filed and roll up the sleeves. And I guarantee you there's going to be a lot of resistance. I guarantee you this is going to be a fight because it's a culture that has been built up and you see the culture in Washington. 
and they don't even realize how far it's gone. Once you change that a little bit, they dig the nails in. We've got to change it, and I'll be fighting for it. Delegate, you have one minute. The public trust. What trust did Henry Lewis get when he brought you, Jeremy, $2 million of aggregated spending that was very questionable? Here's what he got. He got a lecture from you about how he was insubordinate and how he should be disciplined. You threatened him. You asked him, you, you threatened him with being fired. And he fought back. He fought back. That whistleblower fought back. And I am proud to say, in a court of law, a jury agreed 12 to nothing that the city of Alexandria was wrong in firing that whistleblower. And the truth is, Jeremy, you led that attack. You led that attack against Henry Lewis. So what trust do we have in anybody who would fire a whistleblower whose greatest sin was he brought you bad news? You know, when I was a battalion commander, people brought me bad news all the time. But I tried to respond in a positive way and make things better. Our next topic here uh, will be election issues. And uh, the question is, do you support no excuse absentee balloting. Delegate Lingenfelter, you begin. No. I think you go and you vote on election day. I think that you need photo ID. I think that it's fine to have absentee balloting for people who can't uh, legitimately get to the polls, and we've got pretty good laws here in Virginia with respect to that. But I would tell you right now, you'd better keep your eye on voting fraud, because if they can steal your vote, they cancel your vote. And I think it's very, very important that we have integrity around the ballot box. And frankly speaking, folks, I wonder if we do. Mr. McPike, absentee balloting. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to address the, the comments that Scott brought up. You know, first off, the, the issues that he talked about were actually brought up in the Fauquier Times Democrat last week, as you know. And guess what it said, Scott? McPike was cleared of any wrongdoing, period. Absolute shame. Now, let's focus on the issues. The issues here are access to elections. He said no. No. Early voting, or no excuses voting, is not acceptable. I don't know about you. I've commuted for decades, you know, a decade up to, to the D.C. area, and it's tough enough. We have a system that disenfranchises enough with the daily grind. We've got to find ways and means to provide access so people can participate in the process. And yes, cast a vote. Cast a ballot. And when you look at voter ID and, and the other things, if we're going to do this, we need to make sure that it's a combination effort, not just disenfranchising as the legislation passed this year to provide voter IDs laws, but if you can look at it, look at it a holistic approach, which means inclusion. Make sure that people have an opportunity to get to the poll. No excuses. You shouldn't have an excuse to fight through the transportation and the long wait that we all face every day. And guess what? Sometimes you can't vote because you didn't make it on election day. We need to be a more open, we're more high-tech society now. We need to find method, means and method to be more inclusive. As your delegate, I will work to do that, just that. Delegate, you want one minute on that? The jury decided 12 to nothing that the city of Alexandria wrongfully terminated Henry Lewis, a legitimate whistleblower. The city of Alexandria has had to spend in attorney fees in defense of Mr. McPike's wrongful actions as Henry, super, or Henry Lewis's supervisor, $456,000. That cost of public service, folks, is too much for the taxpayers. When whistleblowers bring you bad news, real leaders take that bad news and try to fix the problem not harass the person who brings the bad news. 
Mr. McPike. Thank you. Yeah, I did fix the problem. And a project came on time, under budget, a million dollars on budget. I'll proudly say that and stand up any day of the week to tell you about that. It's absolutely nothing involved in this. We had absolute critical time on the project to make sure it delivered. We had hundreds of thousands of leases at stake and we brought it back and we brought it up back on time. And back to the issues. The issues on the table are whether or not we're going to have an inclusive society and bring people into the fold in the political process or not. We've got too many people that are standing at the sidelines. We've, not, we've got to involve people and engage them in the issues that are important to us. It's fundamental to how we are formed here and fundamental to how we need to govern. And as delegate, we've got to reach out. It's incumbent upon us as representatives to reach out. Not just sit on the sidelines and wait someone to call you about an issue, because the issue's too late. You've got to engage in those communities and make sure we bring the issues to the table, and I'll fight for just that. Our next topic is transportation. The question is, what are your priorities on transportation projects given the 2013 change in transportation funding that is providing more funds for Northern Virginia? Mr. McPike, Mr. McPike you go first. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm glad that, uh, again, Bob McDonald had the courage to step up to the plate as well as uh, other Democrats and Republicans to bring forward the very important bipartisan transportation bill. For far too long, we've been grinding. You know, in fact, you know you've hit Princeton County when you see the brake lights, right? You don't need the sign anymore at the Occoquan Bridge. You can just take it down, you know, because the brake lights are there. We've got to come back and really fight for this area's projects, whether it's making sure our PTC, PRTC and, and bu buses run, extension of VRE to Gainesville and additional ridership to VRE, as well as the long-term forecast of how we get Metro to Woodbridge. You know, we talk about looking at the ex expenditures across the state, and we had the, the 460 bypass road. That's over a billion dollars of your taxpayer monies, a billion dollars. This is a lot of money, folks. When was the last time you heard about a billion dollars coming in to fix Prince William's issues? You haven't. As your delegate, I'm going to be at the table to make sure we fight for our share, our fair share, to help our families and make sure our economy continues to grow. And that's the key. That's how we maintain the top position for business, is make sure we can continue to grow and have, move our people, goods, and services. That's what's at stake. It's vitally important we do that. We've got great hubs with Quantico here. We need to continue to grow, as well as Innovation Park with George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College. We've got the resources. We've got to invest. And we've got to fight to make sure it happens in Prince William. It's time we stop playing second fiddle. It's the same old music, folks. I'm going to raise your taxes. That's what Jeremy McPike is saying to you. It's the same old stuff. The truth of the matter is, you are paying higher taxes in Prince William County, and you're still shipping tons of Northern Virginia money all across the Commonwealth of Virginia. So thank you very much for your interest in helping Prince William County. You've taxed us more, and you're still shipping it out of the community. Look, to your specific question, I think what we have to do is harness technology, innovation. I would support the creation of an innovation technology and transportation fund, direct that VDOT rewrite their entire smart travel plans. The state needs in a true set of goals for technology use. Technology can be a vital help aid in moving traffic. We need to build a consumer-focused transportation network. We have to create a Virginia Transportation Solutions Working Group to work within the Commonwealth Transportation Board, which apparently doesn't even care what Prince William people think about the stupid bypass they want to build and wind up putting tons of truck traffic on 234, right through the middle of the district. I think we also have to specifically look at trans a transportation solutions working group that would be directed to explore things like performance pricing and streamlining and reforming Virginia's traffic operations, implementing uh, what you would call SWAT team accident clearing things. Everybody just amazed at how long it takes to clear an accident on I-95. It's ridiculous. 
And it seems like we can take some lessons from uh, some other states that have done some innovation here. I think we need to look at the smart transportation pilot zones and the technology for drivable vehicles. What's that going to be in 20 years? And I think we ought to be thinking about that as well. And I think we have to worry about guaranteeing our own return, return on investment, creating a statewide transportation priority standard. And top on that is fixed congestion over other things. Mr. McPike. Thank you. You know, you've heard a lot. I, first off, I, I want to clarify, I don't support the Bi-County Parkway. Um, I think it's misdirected, misdirected, and we've got too much at stake across Virginia. Again, an opportunity to step up and be a champion for Prince William. Scott took a pass every chance he got this year. The environment today has got to be about compromise. We have an ability, if you don't like something in the bill, you have an ability to submit amendments. You have an ability to be a voice. But to say that we have no problem, we don't have any transportation issues, is ignoring the economy issues, the family issues, the quality of life issues that we face every day, that I face every day, that I know most of you here face every day. We need a delegate that's going to step up and be a voice and make the tough choices. And yeah, you know, that's where um, many moderate Republicans have come out of the word work to say, you know, I feel disenfranchised from my party because I'm getting called a rhino, a Republican in name only, name only. But yet I understand it takes investment. We've got to make tough choices. Excuse me if I don't take advice on being a good Republican from someone supported by Howard Dean. Um, what compromise did Henry Lewis get, Jeremy, when he was two years short of retirement? Did we sit down and talk to him about working through the problem? No. We fired him. Now, with respect to 234 and the bypass, you know, this is kind of rem reminiscent of John Kerry's I voted for it before I voted against it. Remember that little routine? Well, the truth of the matter is there was $10 million dollars in this budget to advance the approach of this 234 wrong-headed plan. And that was one of the reasons that I did not support this bill. So you really can't have it both ways. And as far as, quote, tough choices, well, Jeremy, when the governor calls you personally, as he did me, and lobby me personally to vote for his bill, I had to make a tough choice, too. And that tough choice was to stand with taxpayers. And I'm proud I did, and I'd do it again. This is our last question for the, uh, for the candidates before we go to our closing statements. And uh, the question is, should there be any restrictions on the use of drones? Delegate Lingenfelder, we start with you. Drones? Drones. <laughs> Well, as an avid hunter and fisherman, I think that we deal with the drone issue as follows. There should be an unlimited bag limit, and you can possess five at any one time. Let me tell you where we ought to use drones. We ought to use drones on the borders of our United States to keep them secure and not in the backyards of people here in Prince William County. That's where we need to be using drones. Look, there is a legitimate law enforcement usage for technology. But believe it or not, while drones did not exist when our Constitution and our founders put that great document together, they were very concerned about our liberties. And it's vitally important that we also remain focused on our liberties. You know, Benjamin Franklin was fond of saying that, you know, if you're willing to give up a little bit of liberty for a little bit of security, you are worthy of neither. We are in a very tough time when it comes to, to technology, Mark. And we are confronted with some tough, tough decisions that we have to make as public policy folks. Sure, there's a legitimate use for drones. 
But at the same time, we've got to have people ever mindful that we have this thing called civil liberties, and we need to protect them. And I swore an oath to that Constitution, both in war and peace, and I've sworn an oath to that Constitution as a delegate to the House of Delegates for 13 years, and I intend to keep that oath. Mr. McPike, Jones. I don't know that we disagree a whole lot on the bag limit. I'm an avid uh, sportsman myself, and uh, in fact was um, you know, happy actually. Um, in 1997, I actually traveled the state and helped purport the constitutional amendment to the Virginia Constitution to guarantee the right to hunt fish. And I'm pleased to say that several years later that passed. And uh, it's one of the important traditions here in Virginia that we need to maintain. Now, I think, number one, we've got to absolutely make sure we actually have protections on the drone issues. Uh, I think we're all concerned about how government tends to creep into things. But I do, and I have heard there's some good applications for agriculture and providing technology to farmers in terms of identifying growth rates and disease and other things. And so we need to be cautious of how it's applied, but yet open to how we can encourage the use of technology to help our small businesses and to our farmers here in Virginia. That's what I'll be looking forward to, to see how we innovate. We have a great tradition of doing that. So we need to be mindful when we talk about bans, but also you know, cautious on its application. And as your delegate, I'll keep a, an open mind to those innovations and help support this economy. Thank you. One minute rebuttal on drones, sir? <laughs> Rebutting on drones, okay. I'll have to refer to my notes. Uh, my, uh, my wife, Shelley, grew up on a dairy farm in Bridgewater, Virginia. And her sister, Mindy, uh, married her uh, Gerald Garber, who has one of the largest dairy farms in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'll have to make a note, Mark, to call Gerald and ask him how drones will help him milk his 400 cows. Um, I'm sure maybe they can. Uh, maybe they can help him grow his uh, crops. Maybe they can help him uh, put down um, pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. But I suspect the greatest use of drones remains in the military realm. And I think that when we allow them to spread into the police world, as tempting as it may be, I think we have to be very, very cautious because it is a slippery, slippery slope. That's the end of the questioning. We are uh, running a little bit behind schedule. We're going to get our closing uh, arguments or closing statements in here, however uh, they pan out. And did we decide before? Mr. Mr. Lingenfelter, you go first with your closing statement. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for um, a robust debate. It, clearly, we do not agree on a number of important issues. Um, but that's what, that's what democracy is. That, that's what it is. There, it's, it's where two points of view come together, and we have to decide. We have to decide what the best course is for our community. I would suggest to you that I am the best choice for this community, given my experience, given my focus, given my work ethic, and given my record standing and taking tough stands, even when they're not the most popular stands. Tough nonetheless. Look, you can go to Jeremy's website, and you can read all about the things that he cares about. You can go to my website. You can, how long do we have, Mark? What is it, five, minutes? five minutes? Okay, five minutes. You can go to my website, and you can, you can read about me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in doing policy wonk stuff. I want to use my closing moments to share with you what's important to me. When the founders brought this country together, they had three things they did. Number one, they won revolution. Well, so what? So too did the Russians and the Chinese and the French. They all won revolutions. 
But all those revolutions fell back into a demonic despotism that was worse than what they overthrew in the first place. What our founders did that was unique to them was having one revolution, they ordered revolution. And they did that through our Constitution, something I am sworn an oath to for 28 years in the Army and 13 now here as a legislator. But our founders did something even more brilliant than that. Having one revolution, an ordered revolution, they sustained revolution. And the way they did that was by advising us to do what Patrick Henry and George Mason used to say, which is a frequent recurrence to founding principles. Thomas Jefferson was a little more radical. He thought we should just have a revolution every 20 years and be done with it. I think the frequent recurrence thing works best. But having one revolution, ordered revolution, and sustain revolution. That's the triangle our founders came up with. But it's that last piece that fascinates me, sustaining. You see, we didn't win revolution, and we didn't order it. But the mission our founders gave us was to sustain it. And the way that revolution is sustained is through what Os Guinness, a Christian apologist, calls the golden triangle of freedom. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith of some sort. And faith of any sort requires freedom. Freedom, virtue, faith. This is the sustainment model of our country. And today, the reason our country is in such turmoil is because we have walked away from biblical truth, the founding vision, and the fundamentals of family. That is why we're in trouble in this country today. But folks, here's the good news. You and I have a mission. And that mission is the mission our founders gave us which is to sustain revolution. Not just liberty, not just freedom, but revolution. And we do that by adhering to our Constitution. That to me is an important thing as well. We haven't talked about it much tonight, but the reason I wanted to use my closing time to share this with you is because it's what makes me tick. That's what makes me tick. Thank you very much for coming out and listening to us. When you go home tonight and people ask you what you did, tell them you went out and sustained revolution. And now Jeremy McPike. Jeremy McPike. It's only fair that I screw up your name. Too. Thank you. E equal opportunity, Alex, to, uh, to take a crack at the name there. Uh, thank you again to the Committee 100. Uh, these, these debates are so important to connect with issues and people. And thank you, Scott. I mean, there's clearly a contrast between the issues and positions on the table. I want to keep government limited and government out of your personal lives. And there's a stark contrast on these issues on transportation. You've heard the contrast on whether or not we're going to be able to invest in making sure our economy grows, that we have jobs for our families, and we invest and make sure our local chambers in Prince William and Fauquier continue to be the best. You've heard about a little bit about education. Now, I've got three girls here. This isn't a sound bite for me. This is personal. I've got three girls here in the public school system. We need to get this right. Education is not an expense. It is an investment, and we need to treat it as such. What worries me most today, and what brought me into this race, is the fundamentals of, in fact, our founding fathers. 
Let's think about it. Our legislature intentionally provided us with two houses, right? And those two houses have a requirement that involves compromise. We've lost the art of compromise, and we've seen it in Washington, and you heard a lot about it today. We've got to restore having a statesman represent us on the issues. That means you might not always like everything in a bill, okay? You might not like everything, but that's what compromise is about, is finding out the best pathway forward. That's what we need to do to work on our tough issues, on standard of learning reforms, on making sure we get the right investment in our transportation. That's what we need to do on our ethics reforms. This is on the table. We've got to make sure we drive these points home and we leave it better than we found it. That's what I was taught growing up. We're supposed to leave it better than we found it. I've been doing that in local government. I've cut my local budget by 18%. My projects have come in on time and on budget. I'm focused and I've been focused on my faith, my family, and serving my community as a firefighter for the last 15 years. And I've been many, with many of you in the best of times and the worst of times. And I'll continue to do so. There are life lessons that you learn by being with people, by being at the doors and being at their side. And as your delegate, I'll continue to do that. It's important we pick up the context and bring that learning, that life learning, to the table and what we do. It has meaning. It has meaning to me every day with what I've seen and what I do. And I look forward to continue this debate over the next 30 days. And there are a lot of important issues coming here in January. And I look forward to hopefully representing the 31st District and proudly represent the Prince William and Fauquier community through the tough issues. We have a lot more issues on the table coming up. And storm water is going to impact businesses. It wasn't talked about today. Look it up. There are lots of regulations that are coming. We need someone who's worked in the sustainable environment issues to make sure we take a regional approach. This is a billion dollar issue, a billion with a B dollar issue on EPA regulations. We make sure, we need to make sure we've got it right. We need to clean up the bay, but we need to do it wisely. This is a major, major issue. I'll be fighting to make sure we figure out a path together. Again, we've got to look at our agricultural interests, our rural communities, our suburban communities, and our urban communities to make sure we've got the right formula for this. This is an important issue. Now, a lot of people are coming and talking about it right now, but it is. It's coming. The state's right in the regulations. We've got to get this one right. What does this all lead back to? It's jobs and economy. This is going to hit the economy. Our investment in education impacts our economy. Whether or not we extend in-state tuition to those we've brought up through our communities, these issues matter. And on transportation, whether we're going to commit to continue to move people, goods, and services, or whether we're going to accept the status quo, what we have today, as being okay. And whether or not we're going to increase toll roads as a solution to our problems. I say no. I see we've got to invest where investment's needed and make the right and tough choices to do it. I thank you very much for spending these, these moments together. I'll be working hard over the next 30 days to reach out and meet and talk about many of the family stories and, and let's hope that Congress gets its act together and they learn the lesson of being statesmen and compromise. That is a fundamental value. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your candidates for the 31st District. We're going to take a short break right here. Uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, opening statements from each candidate. There was a, a coin toss. Delegate Anderson won that coin toss. He elected to go first, so he'll make his first opening statement. Then we'll go into a rounds of questioning. The questions have been compiled by a committee within the Prince William Committee of 100. Uh, they have a wide range of topics. Each candidate will get an opportunity to answer the questions with a two-minute answer and then a one-minute rebuttal. We'll go through those, and at the 
end uh, as time allows. We'll get through as many of these questions as we can. And then there will be an opportunity for closing statements of five minutes. I'll introduce the candidates. If you, you can applaud after I read their very brief bios, which I've abbreviated for time. And if you can hold your comments, chuckles, applause, and whatnot until the end, uh, we will get through this as quickly as possible and get everyone home. So with that said, let me introduce our candidates. We have Delegate uh, Rich Anderson. Uh, he was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in 2009. He graduated from Virginia Tech, and he retired from the United States Air Force as a colonel after 30 years. Are you shushing me? No. Oh, okay. All right. Reed Hiddleston also served in the Air Force, also attained the rank of colonel, retired after 26 years, and he graduated from VMI. Those are the bios I'm going to read for time's sake. We are now going to move into the time of, uh, of to the opening statements, but let me talk about the timekeeper candidates. This is your guy right down here in the blue shirt. Hard to miss. He's got Delegate Anderson. You're not watching. This is going to right here. All right. Okay. He's got his time cards. He'll show you the countdown: two minutes, one minutes, twenty seconds. And at that point, I stand up and, and get angry. Um, and audience, keep it down, and we will uh, move through. So. With that said, we will begin our opening statements. Delegate Anderson. Thank you, Mark. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the Prince William Committee of 100. I've been a member of the organization for five years. I joined when I was still in uniform, and it was a great opportunity for me to learn the local issues that confront us here in Prince William County. So I appreciate being here. I'd especially like to thank my wife, Ruth, who is seated down here in blue at the table there. She's been my partner in life. She is the one who essentially led me from a path of military service to public service. And so I will always be indebted to that. It was just four years ago, four and a half years ago, that I made the decision to retire after 30 years of military service. And so it was at that time that I presented myself as a candidate for the Virginia House of Delegates. I closed that chapter of my life where Ruth and I together had worn the cloth of the country for a full 51 years. And we began the present journey that we're on. And so you might say, Ruth and I left the service to serve. Me in the House of Delegates and Ruth leading a nonprofit organization here in Northern Virginia that does humanitarian services overseas. And so in the campaign of 2009, I knocked on 27,000 doors. 27,000 doors. For nine months, I lived at doors. And I knocked on more doors than any delegate candidate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I've continued to knock on those doors over the last four years. One of the models that I've used, my business model, has been if I get a constituent call or email. I like to make house calls. Doc Anderson makes house calls. So over the fa past four years, I have sat on the living room couches of literally thousands and thousands of our fellow citizens here in Prince William County. And so that's what I've done. Four years ago, I tell you what, I learned at all those doors and have learned since. And that is jobs, jobs, jobs are the preeminent focus of our fellow citizens here in Prince William. It's no coincidence that Virginia was just named by Forbes as the best place in America to do business. That Governing Magazine has called us the best managed state in the country. That the Pew Center on the states, with whom I work to pass a military voter bill, designated us as the best place to raise a child. And Education Weekly has called us the fourth best in education quality. That ain't good enough, but it's not bad. <coughs> We've kept taxes low, we've balanced budgets, we've put $700 million in the rainy day fund. A few more years, we'll have it to 17, or, or uh, $1 billion rather. So four years ago, I pledged to be an engaged delegate, focused representative in Virginia, and I think that the place for anyone who cares deeply about this commonwealth is on the floor of the House of Delegates. Thank you very much. Mr. Hamilton. Good evening. First, I would like to thank the committee, 
the 100, Mark C. Graves and Delegate Anderson for making this event possible tonight. I believe uh, a discourse such as this is, is essential to the su success of our democracy. My name is Reed Heddleston. I'm a father, a grandfather, an Air Force veteran, a husband, and a businessman. I was born in Seoul, Korea, the son of an Army officer. Like many children in this district, I grew up on, arm, on or near Army posts in the United States and Germany. I was selected for a four-year ROTC scholarship at VMI. Following my graduation from, from VMI with a degree in economics, I studied at Emory University in Atlanta where I received an MBA in finance. Following my graduation in Atlanta, I reported to flight school where I earned my fi flight uh, wings in the United States Air Force. I had the privilege to serve in the United States Air Force for 26 years, primarily flying and buying bombers. I had the honor to command a squadron and a flying group, the highlights of my career. I retired out of the Office of Secretary of Defense and began working for Science Applications International Corporation, a Fortune 500 company here in Northern Virginia. During my 14 years at SAIC, I worked my way up from program manager to senior vice president, where I managed the 200. For 20 years, I raised my children in a safe neighborhood and great public schools. I was able to work as a businessman in a state that was named the number one state in the country to do business. And I know this is hard to believe, but at one time, I didn't spend most of my time stuck on 95 trying to get home to my wife and children for supper. But over the last four years, Virginia has changed. We went from having a moderate state government that solved problems and addressed our real priorities to an ideologically driven government that is more concerned about telling women what they can and can't do with their bodies. Richmond has focused on an extreme social agenda, and because of that, our economy, our public education system, and our roads have paid the price. As a businessman working in the private sector for 14 years, I know that to atta attra attract and create the jobs, we need to have tax cuts and incentives for small and intermediate businesses. And we need to create the future jobs that we want here for our children. We need to give Virginia companies a first break at state contracts, a Buy American Act at the state level, so we, we create jobs here and not in China. And I will also fight to turn around Prince William County Public Schools that currently have the highest class sizes in the state and the lowest teacher pay in the region, the second lowest teacher pay in the region. I'm running for the Virginia House of Delegates because I do not believe our current delegate is addressing our real priorities. So please join me in telling Richmond that it's time we step, uh, step up to solve our real problems. I ask for your support and vote in November. Thank you. All right, we're going to begin our uh, question. Again, the candidates will each get two minutes to answer and then a one-minute rebuttal. Again, keep an eye on the timekeeper. We're going to keep this thing moving. Uh, Delegate Anderson, you will get the first answer here with this. The question is on economy and jobs. And the question is, Virginia was recently named by Forbes magazine as the best state in the country to do business. What should be done to ensure that Virginia remains the best place in the country for job creators? Delegate Anderson. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you are right. Virginia was just named uh, the best state in the country in which to do business. We had held that position in previous years, and we lost that position. It went down. Then it came back up. It, but we have consistently stayed in the top two or three positions in this ranking. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, We've also been named as the best managed state, the best state in which to raise a child, the fourth, fourth best in education quality. But we've got to continue to move forward and do better. It is a journey. It is not a destination. What we have to do is we have to continue to keep this business climate in the future just what it is today so that we bring businesses here. There is an exodus of businesses from places like Maryland down to Virginia because of our tax policy, because of our business-friendly policies, because of a whole uh, number of things such as cutting red tape. And so we have got to get, get uh, this, maintain this uh, whole credibility that we have. If we don't, those businesses coming from Maryland 
will come right through Virginia and go to North, South Carolina, or other places that offer a more business-friendly environment. I hear it all the time when we're in the General Assembly. I hear it from businessmen here who I have interfaced with, and that is the business-friendly policies here in Virginia. We've got to continue that. Sir? After spending 14 years in business in Northern Virginia, I understand what it takes to attract jobs. We need to make sure we have tax incentives in place that make sense. We need to reward investment in companies, investment retained earnings by the people that own the companies, and we need to adjust our tax policies accordingly. The transportation bill can support over 10,000 jobs per year in Virginia over the next six years. That's 60,000 job years. It's 1.7 billion of direct transportation funding can generate 2.8 billion dollars in total economic impact in the next six years. If we do expand Medicaid, we get 21 billion for our health care system, and we create 33,000 new jobs. This is how you create jobs in Virginia. I'll tell you how you don't create jobs in Virginia. You don't create jobs because over the next 10 years, 30 percent of the CEOs of women uh, of of high technology companies will be women. And if you can continue to treat women the way you do in this state, they are not coming to Virginia. My opponent voted against the historic transportation bill. What he fails to point out is, yes, we were first in the nation, and we dropped from thir the third and fifth, primarily because of our failure to fund a transportation bill. We funded a transportation bill, and now we're number one. That's the reason we're number one again. My opponent likes the idea of sequestration. I will tell you, sequestration is absolutely the worst way to run a government there is, and we're beginning to feel the effects of that. So we need to create jobs because we're going to have to offset what is happening at the federal level. Delegate Anderson, one minute rebuttal. Well, there's no way I'll answer all that with just one minute, so let me just say this. Creation of jobs. I carried a bill that has now put nearly 4,000 veterans back to work in full-time paying jobs with 90 percent of the jobs in this country over the last five years have been part-time jobs. The Virginia Values Veterans Program. I'll talk about that more later. Sequestration. I'm not a fan of sequestration. I've got two friends down here that are suffering from that and people from all over this county. I had a sequestration town hall with a sellout crowd here in Lake Ridge. I've got an idea of what it feels like on the basis of the feedback I got there. And in November, I'm going to do another sequestration town hall for those who are affected outside of the Department of Defense because there are ripple effects that exist all throughout um, Northern Virginia society. Mr. Heddleston, you get one minute rebuttal. In 2010, Anderson voted to cut $5 million from Virginia Tuition Assistance Grant. In 2010, Anderson helped eliminate the Eminent Scholars Program. We have walked away from education in this state in the name of lower taxes. We have stopped investing in our children. That's not how you attract jobs to Northern Virginia. That's not how you attract jobs to Virginia. I spoke with a dean at George Mason. He is starting salaries of 60000 That doesn't go far in Fairfax County. How does he attract great professors to GMU? And he does. He goes to UCLA and he says, you can take your children out of private schools and you can put them in the finest public schools in the country. That's why we need to invest in public schools. Now, before we move on to the second question, I forgot to ask the audience a question that I like to ask, ask in the 31st uh, race. In, in this race of those people here in the audience, how many of you are undecided right now as to how you'll vote? Well, there's your guy. Oh, there's a couple of guys. All right, now we got a few more hands Everybody popping up. Else? Yeah, all right. Here we go. This is our, our next question is on health care. Uh, Mr. Edelson, you will go first on this. What role is appropriate for state legislatures in, legislators in regulating women's reproductive health choices? Mr. Edelson. As a husband, a father, and a grandfather, I know the last thing politicians need to be 
is involved in personal health care decisions of women. I believe the decision to use birth control is between a woman and her doctor. A politician has no place in this discussion. The government does not belong in our personal lives. I respect women to make their own health care decisions. Delegate Anderson. This is your first two minutes. Thank you. Let me just put a, put a phrase on the table, because it's sitting there. Let's talk about it. War on women. That's what you've heard from this gentleman over here. War on women. It is a fictional construct. It is fictional. What is factual is the war on your wallet. I am pro-life. I ran as a pro-life legislator in 2009 and 2011. That is broadly known. I'm not going to apologize for my positions on that issue, but I'm practical. I cannot stop abortion. No governor, no president, no congressman, no legislator, no doctor, no newspaper editor, no citizen. And so I'm practical about it. My vote on the ultrasound bill was for women's health. Why? In virtually every instance, the procedure is performed. And this will catch the Dr. Gosnells, first of all. Second of all, the legislation was sponsored by many women in the Virginia House of Delegates. Thirdly, the three physicians in the House of Delegates explained to us why this was for a woman's health, to determine the gestational age of the baby. And so these are not things I'm focused on. Nobody in this room has heard me talk about these things. What you've heard me talk about is all of these other important issues. The texting bill that we did that ultimately will save lives. The Virginia Values Veterans Program that we did, that I did. The fact that I was the legislator this year who was named by Virginia's disabled community as their legislator of the year because I have done more this year than any other legislator to assist that very special group of people in our commonwealth. So you will hear this, but it's fiction. Mr. Edelson, one minute. My opponent does not respect women enough to, make their, to allow them to make their own health care decisions. Anderson voted for a plan that could ban birth control. The American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists warned of the ban on birth control. In fact, Vivian Watts, a delegate, brought in an amendment to say that birth control would, would be excluded from the bill. Anderson voted against the amendment, the Watts amendment. He voted for, for banning birth control. He supports a plan that could call for police to do an investigation on any woman who suffers a miscarriage. I think that's an incredibly difficult time for any couple. And to saddle them with that requirement smacks of a police state. He voted to deny women access to affordable breast and cervical cancer screenings. And as, as he told you, he voted for transvaginal ultrasound. Mr. Anderson, one minute. First of all, I believe in birth control is an important element in family planning, planning. This is pure poppycock. He's speaking of this in the context of the, parent, the, the uh, personhood bill in which we inserted a very specific amendment that said nothing in this section should be interpreted as affecting lawful contraceptions and several other items in there. So this is untrue. It is misleading. Actually, I hate to use this word, but it's a lie. Anyone out there who repeats it. And so that's where I am there. I do respect women. This is untrue. Our next topic that we'll go to, environment and energy. Adele Anderson, you'll go first here. Are there any energy sources in Virginia that, that should be foregone? Are, are there any energy sources Virginia, Virginia should forego? That is a very good question. I'll come back and just touch on what Delegate Lingenfelter had to say. And that is, um, we have an energy challenge in this country. I know this as a former military officer, and that is our dependence on foreign sources of energy. 
we're vulnerable in that regard. I recall back in 1976, 77, if you'll recall, President Carter focused on this very heavily. We have not solved that yet. I'm in favor of all of the above energy technology. It is too premature to stamp out the use of coal and oil, carbon fuels. It is way too premature. This attempt to move into alternative energy, which I agree with, has to be done cautiously. That's the reason we ended up with a Solyndra earlier this year, at the cost to the American taxpayer of $500 million. Technology pushed too soon, too fast. American history is replete with successes, from the Wright brothers on up to the use of vaccines and into the modern age by experimentation and research that is in fact done in a measured way. It is too premature for some of those things, but I do believe that we need to move into them. And I do believe we need to open the Virginia shore to drilling for natural gas, which the experts tell us there is a plentiful supply. Mr. Hiddleston, Energy Sources. Here in Virginia, we have an energy opportunity. We have to have a diversified energy strategy that encompasses a variety of sources. That includes offshore oil and gas and wind. With offshore wind alone, we can supply 10% of Virginia's power and create 10,000 jobs in the process. Virginia has 1,000 megawatts of wind power. Tapping into offshore wind could result in 2.7 million in new payments to landowners in the state. I join the majority of Virginians in supporting ending the moratorium on offshore oil and natural gas production. And I think that Virginia should earmark 25% of its oil and natural gas revenues for environmental conservation efforts, with 75% going into the general fund. I have been endorsed by the Sierra Club. I'm referring to the earlier question, I've been endorsed by Virginia Now and the Women's Strike Force. Delegate Anderson, one minute. I think that uh, wind energy off the Virginia coast does, in fact, offer some opportunities. I have voted to do some state-level investments in wind energy experimentation. I think that um, these opportunities for all of the above energy sources is good for Virginia. Governor McDonald has said he wants to make Virginia the energy capital of the East Coast. Across the board, we have plentiful energy supplies and we've got to tap them rather than have our initiatives inhibited by the federal government. And I think that'll do it. Mr. Edelson. I think we're in agreement. I'm not sure what the federal <laughs> government had to do with it, but I'll give you that minute back. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> Our next question is on public safety. Mr. Edelson, you will go first. The question is, what legislation would you support to eliminate human trafficking? Well, I, I, would, I would support any legislation to, uh, to oppose human trafficking. Uh, I think there's nothing more despicable uh, that I could think of. So uh, I have no specifics on, on uh, legislation that, uh, that I would uh, be interested in, but I would certainly support any, any reasonable effort to stop trafficking. Delegate Anderson. Well, I think Mr. Heddleston and I are in violent agreement here. I think that the most egregious ill that one person could visit on another person is this sort of thing such as human trafficking. This year in the General Assembly, I was proud of some of the legislation we passed to combat that. I didn't carry it. I voted for it. Our very own Prince William delegate, Tim Hugo, played a f sizable leadership role in his human trafficking uh, legislation that he did. I can tell you one thing. In terms of public safety and law enforcement, while I do favor sensible sentencing guidelines, I think for these people who commit these most egregious crimes, 
against the weaker members of our society, whoever they may be, need to spend a long, long time in a penal institution. Mr. Hiddleston, you have one minute rebuttal. I do not disagree. Delegate Anderson, one minute. I agree with his agreement. <laughs> all right, and here we go. We're all going to get home. <laughs> all right, this is our next question, and it is on taxes. Delegate Anderson, you'll go first, and the question is, in view of the recent transportation bill signed into law this year, do you think that higher taxes for Prince William County puts us at a competitive disadvantage with our neighboring counties? Delegate Anderson. I most certainly do. And the reason I do is the research bears it out. The testimony I've heard from Virginia's business community tells me that. Individual businessmen and women have told me exactly what it does. In our own case here in Prince William County, because we're located in Planning District 8, which is defined as Northern Virginia, we have a substantially higher level of taxation now for our county as opposed to Fauquier County, as opposed to Stafford County, and it is very large. I've seen some estimates on the differential as high as $160 a year per person in Prince William County and $50 in those other two counties. So that's a differential. I am hearing that from businessmen uh, and women uh, constantly. And so I think that puts us at a strategic disadvantage. Um, and all these things taken together have made this very important part of Virginia where we're a real economic generator. It's hampered our capacity to do certain things. And so that's one of the reasons that I couldn't vote for the uh, transportation tax bill. And I can discuss that in greater detail perhaps with another question, but most certainly that played a major role. It was not fair to Prince William County, and especially because if you get into the transportation bill, we get roughly 30 cents, and that's rough, 30 cents back on the dollar that we send downrange to other portions of our commonwealth. Mr. Edelson. Well, I would have supported the trans uh, transportation bill. And the reason I would have supported it is because we need roads here, and we need a comprehensive transportation solution. And we were forced to pay for it, but unlike my opponent, these things don't happen without revenue. Uh, he, he opposed the bill. What, what, he, what he fails to, to realize is the economic impact of Northern Virginia. We will benefit the most from the transportation bill. 1.7 billion of the direct transportation funding can generate 2.8 billion in total economic impact in the next five years. When you build a road in Virginia, and I built roads when I was in college working for Leo Vasilio out of Beckley, West Virginia on interstate highways, you hire Virginians. They buy Virginia houses. They buy cars at automobile dealers in Virginia. It's called the multiplier effect if you've had economics. That's the impact we will gain, and I believe that it is worth the revenue that we will put forward because unless we embark on a comprehensive transportation plan, we're never going to get there. We need to look at Metro in Prince William County. Four years ago, my opponent said it's too far in the future. Four years have passed. Nothing has been done. Silver Line has been built 28 miles to Dulles. We can build all the way through Fairfax eight miles to get it down here to Prince William County. It can be done. We need to start. What you don't understand is the impact that transportation brings economic, economically to a region. The bill was supported by Tommy Norman, Speaker Howell, and the governor. These things don't happen without some sort of investment. That's what my opponent doesn't understand. He's never been in industry. He's never had to make the critical calls on investment. Mr. Anderson, one minute. I still stand by my vote for the most massive tax increase in Virginia history, the largest tax increase since the settlers landed at Jamestown four centuries ago. I will not be a part of a tax increase like that. It was regressive. It rides on the backs of the poor. There have been detailed studies done. There were other methodologies. I agree we need more, more uh, revenues for transportation. and. I put this bill in 
I presented it at the transportation, or rather the House Finance Committee, to move it through. It did such things as remove the food tax, a very progressive bill that did not ride on the backs of poor people, and still raised a considerable amount of revenue, and was scored by the Virginia Department of Taxation as a small tax decrease. And so there are other methodologies, not this bill that started out as a transportation bill and became a monstrous tax increase. I don't have enough time to explain inflation to a political science major, but I can tell you that there will be $2.8 billion in positive impact in Northern Virginia. There will be 60,000 jobs, 10,000 per year for the six years of the bill. If you want to create jobs, you have, you have to spend money as a government. It just doesn't happen any other way. This massive tax increase was a Republican bill. <laughs> it, was, it was actually a bipartisan bill led by the Republicans. We were out of money for highways. If you want to get in your car, drive south of Richmond on 95 to 85, and you will see an interstate highway system that is crumbling away. And then you cross into North Carolina and you have a six-lane brand new interstate from Raleigh all the way to Charlotte. I grew up in West Virginia. I never thought I'd see the day when West Virginia had better interstate highway systems than Virginia. Our next question is on education. And uh, Mr. Edelson, you will go first. Do you support tax relief or some, any type of tax support for private homeschool or charter school students? This is a topic where we're really beginning to fall behind and we're facing a crisis in the district. As I said, I will fight to turn around Prince William County Public Schools. We have the highest class sizes in the state. And we have the lowest, second lowest teacher pay in the region. And I don't care how many graduations or SOL testing sessions my opponent goes to that doesn't provide resources to schools to address our problems. We're the seventh wealthiest state in the nation, but ranked 35th in our elementary and, and secondary school spending. We spend 11.4% less per student today than we did in 2008. The teachers that are sitting in this room will tell you we are in crisis as far as secondary education. We need to raise our teacher pay to the national average. We need to reduce non-instruction workloads for our educators, and we need to reform standards of learning. I do not support taking public money and allowing it to be sent in private religious secondary schools. That's your right. You have that right. But I believe that Jefferson said a democracy demands an educated electorate, and we do that through our public schools, where children will meet the peer group that they're going to compete with and work with for the rest of their lives. Mr. Anderson. Absolutely. I'm going to have to find it, of course. Uh, it was basically about whether or not you supported any kind of tax relief or tax support for homeschool or charter schools. Okay. Like energy, I'm a supporter of all the above forms of education. I am for introducing competition into the educational arena. I think we have to take special care of public education because the founders intended that. But also, we have other options for parents. I am, in, I am for parental choice, homeschooling, charter schools, all sorts of educational opportunities for kids. I voted to increase pay for teachers this year, the first state pay raise in four years. And I'll tell you what it did. It took Virginia's teachers up to the national average for teacher pay. That's not good enough. It ought to be higher, but that's what it did this year. That's something neither the Kane administration nor the Warner administration were able to do, but working together and across party lines in Richmond, we were in fact able to do that. In fact, today we're spending more on K-12 than during the Kane administration. We have recovered that. I sponsored the cost of competing allowance recovery for teachers in Northern Virginia. I wanted them to keep that cost of living allowance that they had. The governor took it out of the budget 
it was recommended by JLARC, the Joint Legislative Audit Review Commission, to stay in. With a, several other delegates, I sponsored a piece of legislation to try to keep it in. We were only partially responsible. I've already talked to Chairman Waltz of the school board, super, or, uh, Superintendent Waltz of the school board, and I intend with others here in Prince William County, and hopefully, probably will be across party lines, to carry that again in January and so if, see if we can get it inserted in the new biennium. I voted to reduce um, regulations and mandates on local schools. I voted for more funding for school safety and for the school safety officers in November. I'm going out to see a school lockdown at Patriot High School so I can understand that much better. But I, I support our public schools because they're a vital part of America. At a time when our college students are facing mountains of debt, my opponent cut $8.4 million from grants and scholarships for Virginia college students. My opponent has voted to cut $620 million from K-12 through public schools. The pay raise that he touts, he needs to talk to teachers. I've knocked on thousands of doors in this county, too, and I'm getting a different story. And what teachers, teachers tell me is they look to see what their paycheck was going to be this year with the 2% raise. They added more hours to the teacher's contract. They increased their contribution to their uh, 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 retirement fund. And they received less take-home pay in their paycheck. I will tell you, if I treated employees like that at SEIC, I would be out of business. I can tell you that I am endorsed by the Virginia Education Association I don't believe you showed up to talk to the Virginia Education Association. Thank you. The cut which he speaks of was in 2010, when revenues were down, when Governor King came into us with a multi-billion dollar tax increase, and we had to cut, we had to cut the budget to meet our obligations to balance the budget. And so as a result, that's what we did. We have now reinserted that back in. But I'm telling you, in 2010, when we showed up in Richmond, we had to cut the budget by $6 billion in the face of this economy that has existed since then. And so we did that. The increase in teachers' pay is something I was proud to support, and I agree with Mr. Heddleston, we've got to do more for our teachers. And I was out of town and wasn't able to go to the Prince William Education Association meeting, so instead I scheduled a separate meeting with its executive director. I've talked to him. We'll talk to him again before we go down to Richmond. This next topic is election issues. Uh, Delegate Anderson, you will begin. The question is, do you support any changes to laws concerning either ca campaign finance or gifts to elected officials? Delegate Anderson. Yes. I'm glad you asked that question. There is a dramatic and vital need to reform ethics here in Virginia. We did something in 2010 or 11, I can't remember which, but it was not far-reaching enough. I sit on the executive committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures. There are 30 of us who sit on that body, and the rest of the organization consists of all 7,300 legislators throughout America. For the last six months, I've been working with our ethics staff on best practices in all the states so that we can replicate the very best in an ethics reform bill here in Virginia. I think we've got to have a reporting system that's more frequent than annually. We've got to include family members and other dependents. We've got to take a serious look at CAPS. We've got to do a rigorous training program, not only at the time of election, but also recurring training, either annually or at re-election. And we've got to keep create mechanisms by which we hold public officials, elected and appointed, accountable. Now, he's going to tell you something later on that I've traveled around the country and I've spent all this money luxuriating at resorts. I'll tell you what I've done. I have met my commitment representing the Commonwealth of Virginia as one of only 30 legislators in these United States who sit on a body 
that governs the organiza professional organization that includes 7,300 legislators from across the country. It's their collective wisdom that I'm tapping right now to work on this bill, and you will see it soon. And you'll also probably see uh, mail for me in which I want you to talk to me. I want you and your neighbors to call me at home, on my cell phone, get in touch with me, because the best ideas don't always reside with the Virginia legislature. I can certainly agree with that, Rich. Um, when you and I were in the Air Force, we were taught that accepting gifts from people doing business with the government was unethical and illegal behavior, dealt with by enforcing severe penalties. And these penalties were on both sides of the act, the person that gave the gift and the person that received the gift. Because accepting gifts corrodes confidence and faith in the government. And I worked in weapons system acquisition. I worked the B-1 program and the B-2 program. And the rules are strict and they are enforced. I've knocked on thousands of doors and received a vehement response to gift-giving scandals in this state. And I will tell you, it is dramatic. There are people that are very, very upset. So I'm not going to talk about your fourth highest travel budget. I'm going to talk about you lived under a clear ethical code for 30 years in the military, but when you went to Richmond, you voted against legislation to expand the ban on accepting contributions and gifts from contract bidders. You voted to make it more difficult to investigate corrupt politicians. My favorite is you did the get out of jail free card that if somebody was being investigated for prosecution, a legislature can say, I resign and the charges are dropped. You accepted thousands of dollars of gifts, including $655 to attend a football game. Rich, if you want to see a football game, buy a ticket. You do not have the right or privilege to do that because you sit in the legislature. We go to Richmond to serve this district. And I will tell you, gifts are corrosive. They are nothing but legalized graft and corruption. And the, the comment earlier that I reported those, well, guess what happens if you don't report them? Nothing. It's the Steve Martin defense by Cuccinelli. I forgot. I forgot. I thought it was only seven, not $18,000. Ladies and gentlemen, I've had a lot of Thanksgiving dinners in my lifetime. Mostly they've got the damn green bean casserole with the, the french fried onions on top and the mushroom soup. Time. If I ever had a $1,500 Thanksgiving dinner, I would never forget it. I, I would know that for the rest of my life. That would be the last thing before I died, I remember. Mr. Anderson. Thank you. He may have been to thousands of doors. I've been to tens of thousands of doors and tens and tens over the last four years, and I've been this year. In fact, what I hear at the doors, besides the concern of people for these issues, is they haven't seen him at their doors. He has not been at the doors with the same energy and vigor and devotion that myself, Ruth, our campaign team has been. I will say this, simply. I'm going to put a bill in for this because I got trapped into something that I didn't care for, and that is that Ruth and I went to a Virginia Tech versus Idaho State, I think it was, game. And we were notified by the sponsoring organization that it was worth $600. So on my form, I did two things. Number one, I put down both of us, even though she was not required to be reported, and I told the folks at Dominion Power I would not be going back to any of those. They were, I believe, three years ago. And so that's my take on this. Anyone here who knows me knows that ethics is central to the way I've always operated. Our next question has to do with transportation. Where do you stand on the proposed bi-county parkway that will cut through parts of the Manassas battlefield and lead to more truck traffic coming down Route 234 through the eastern part of the county and close Route 234 through the park? Mr. Heddleson, you begin. I've reneged on that minute I gave you back earlier. I apologize. I've been consistent on this issue since I began the campaign. 
We have a rural crescent for a reason. We want to keep it rural. The Bi-County Parkway will only increase development, causing more traffic. If you do an outer beltway, it's not going to solve our transportation problem. It's going to create more people trying to get to and from Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. It does nothing to address our real problem of getting people to and from Northern Virginia and D.C. I've been consistent on this issue since I began the campaign. Rich signed on to one of the original proposals sponsoring the Bi-County Parkway. He went to all the meetings earlier this year, and you could see him in the back stunned. And of course, his supporters said that he was very upset with what was going on. Actually, he realized that he had sponsored the bill that now the people that were in the district were upset with. And those thousands of doors I knocked on, some were in Coles and Brentsville. And people were very upset about your stand on the Bi-County Parkway. He's now changed his position. I'm extremely happy to see that he's come over to the correct side on the Bi-County Parkway, but it's called a flip-flop. Mr. Anderson. There's no flip-flop here. I have consistently been against this parkway for the same reason I was against the way in which the Affordable Health Care Act moved its way through Congress. It was forced on people. The same reason I was against the transportation tax increase. It was forced on people. And now the Bi-County Parkway forced on people. Government on both sides of the aisle has now decided that they know what's best for the citizens of this great republic and for this commonwealth. And so I have stood consistent. Marianne Gadban, who has led a, one, a, a small nucleus of people who have planned this, she's here tonight. She's been part of my education. That group is standing firm. I'm not a no parkway person. No where, no way, no how. I am for move that parkway footprint to another location further east that doesn't involve extensive uh, uh, eminent domain seizures of private property. The people of Virginia spoke last uh, November when they voted for that provision to change our constitution of the Commonwealth. And it's important that we respect that and figure out a pathway for this parkway that does create an avenue of approach to Dulles Airport to feed what is one of the greatest economic engines in the state. One of us is, is at least a significant economic engine. But for goodness sake, going up the west edge of the Manassas National Battlefield Park and encroaching on that historic land is absolutely wrong. I am with those people. It involved no flip-flop. Mr. Heddleston, one minute rebuttal. Well, I don't know what to say. You signed one of the original proposals for it uh, over two years ago. Uh, you've, you were a supporter of it, and, and you called a press conference to announce your change in position. So uh, I, I guess I don't understand what it means to be a politician, to change your stand, and then explain it didn't happen. But I'm going to work on that, folks. Mr. Anderson? Well, first of all, I've never been at a press conference. My introduction to the uh, Bi-County Parkway issue was when I came back in late February There was an, from the General Assembly session. There was an early March meeting out in the Haymarket area at a middle school. I attended that. I didn't understand the issue. I attended that, and I did what I'm supposed to do as a legislator. I learned about the concerns in the community over this parkway. And in turn, I took the next steps, which was to sit down first with uh, those who favor or those who are working to move the, the Bi-County Parkway uh, folks who are concerned about it being uh, in that location. And then I also went out and walked the battlefield so I could see where roads would be constructed, roads would be closed. And I did that with Ed Clark, the superintendent of the Manassas National Battlefield Park. I believe in doing that, listening to both sides. And so I haven't been to a press conference because, quite frankly, I spend my time less at press conferences and more in the living rooms of my constituents. All right, this will be our final question before we go to uh, closing statements. 
And this will go to Delegate Anderson first. And it is, uh, should the Commonwealth of Virginia replace the standards of learning with Common Core? Delegate Anderson. Well, Mr. Haddleston, uh, at the beginning of this, in response to a question, uh, in somewhat of a denigrating way, perhaps, but that's what debates are all about, spoke about my attendance at an SOL testing session. David Huckstein, who's one of the half dozen great high school principals I've come to know over the last four years, asked me to come to Woodbridge Senior High School and to see how the Vikings there engaged in SOL testing. I saw it firsthand, and I came away with the conclusion that we are trying to test excessively. And it is driving teachers to do what? Teach to the test, rather than to teach to practical levels of learning. I'm not on the education committee. Therefore, I don't have a core, core expertise in this. That's why over the last four years, and you can ask just about any principal in the old or the new 51st district, Hardly a week would go by that I was not in their school immersed in some subject matter in order to understand what they were doing. So in education, I think some significant reforms that we need, among others, are we need to take a long, hard look at how we're doing this SOL testing. It opened my eyes as I was in that audience or walking through uh, Woodbridge Senior High School for four hours. We need to do like we talked about before. We do need to elevate teacher pay because it's one of those noble passion professions. People get called to it because it's a passion. And so um, I think that we have got to do some work with that. I chair a body called the Virginia Commission on Civics Education. I didn't seek that position out. The speaker put me on the commission. My fellow members, Republicans and Democrats alike, elected me as chairman of the commission. And I have been working with schools all across the state to enrich the level of civics education along with history and government for our students. Mr. Huddleston? Would you please repeat the question? I'd be I happy to. I didn't hear an answer to it in there. Should the Commonwealth of Virginia replace the standards of learning with Common Core? My understanding is that we have relaxed standards of learning within the state. And we did that in the face of scores that were unacceptable. So I guess uh, that's not really watering the booze, but what we've done is, is we've lowered the standard. And the problem is the Common Core is accepted widely throughout the United States. And what's going to happen is, is if we relax standards of learning and we, we're out of sync with the Common Core, uh, now, now we're placing our students at a disadvantage because they're not going to be educated to the level that they're educated in other states. When I was knocking doors, obviously unknown to the delegate here, I met a PhD from Rutgers. He had moved into a townhouse just across, uh, across uh, Old Bridge from Westridge Elementary. The reason they moved in, into the house was because obviously it was cheaper than Fairfax. He works at the State Department but they were extremely concerned with cuts in, in education and what it meant to assistant teachers that were assigned to the classes at Westridge because that was, they have twin boys and they're, they're very concerned with their education. Both he and his wife have PhDs. And they, were, they asked me, why are we relaxing the standards of learning? And I understand layering on requiring the requirement, requirement why you don't give resources to teachers, but we really need to think long and hard about going out of sync with the rest of the country because his specific question is, if I move to Maryland, are my children going to be able to compete? Delegate Anderson. Yep. I'm concerned about this whole concept of Common Core because it's a nationally levied requirement on schools. It's an it's an imposition and an intervention in public schools by the National Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education, when those decisions are best made either at the state level, marginally, but best made at the local level by school divisions. 
That's why I've almost always voted to try to move decision-making authority down to school boards and to school divisions. That's very important. In fact, um, standards of learning were not relaxed. Standards of learning were recently uh, elevated to a higher level of performance, and as a result, we had math scores I can't remember which it was, but math and English scores, one went up and one went down. I can't recall. Perhaps an educator here in the audience can enlighten me afterwards. But nonetheless, Common Core is not good for the Commonwealth of Virginia and its students. Uh, do you still have a minute coming? You do. I don't know. You're the you, do. you do. You do. You do. You do. My little thing. My little thing was on this side. I'm having. Enough, I'm having enough trouble being the candidate. I can't do your job too. Uh, I think we need to get back to investing in our schools. That's what. That's what we're losing sight of. We need to invest in our children's future. We cannot walk away from. Them. People invested in me. I received a scholarship to go to VMI. I would not have been able to go there. I received a fellowship to go to Emory University. People invested in me, we have a responsibility to invest in our children. We need to get more resources into our schools, and we need, need to stop uh, worrying so much about revenue. I think we need to reach down and make the sacrifice, because this is the future we're talking about. That completes our round of questioning. We're now going to go to our closing statements. Each candidate will get five minutes. Delegate Anderson, you go first. No, you, right. you went first, right? You're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, a sincere thank you to the Prince William Committee of 100. Denny, I'm so proud to be a member of the organization. It's been such an important part of my public education, and I sincerely mean that. I want to thank Ruth uh, for having taken this little journey with me first through collective 51 years in the Air Force and then now four years in the General Assembly and I hope for many more years to come. If I could uh, pick who I would like to model, when I grow up in this business I would like to be either Supervisor John Jenkins or Senator Chuck Colgan, long and distinguished service to our Commonwealth. And I'd like to thank uh, Colonel Heddleston for going on this journey with me. I don't call him my opponent, he's my running mate, because we're running in a lot of the same places, let me tell you. He's not my enemy. He's not my opponent. He's simply my competitor in a whole business model. He has a model, I have a model. Over the last four years, and especially since March returning home from the General Assembly, I have knocked on tens of thousands of doors. It's my stock and trade, it's the way I do business. I've knocked on your door, I have knocked on your door, I've knocked on your door, and looking in the back of the room, I see three or four folks whose doors I've knocked on. I will go any door, anywhere, anytime to talk to anyone. <coughs> I've listened and learned over the last four years, and I think I know what the men and women and, and families of Prince William County are thinking. And so now I'm ready to go back to work come January. I served my country for 30 years. I served the Commonwealth for four and I would like to serve it again for at least another two. The last four years, I've been able to chair the General Assembly Military and Veterans Caucus and move literally dozens of pro-military, pro-veteran, pro-work, pro-Virginia pieces of legislation through the Assembly that affect in positive ways the lives of 830,000 of our fellow Virginians who have worn the cloth of our country. I want to continue to do that in jobs said it before, lowest unemployment, one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country, and therefore we are the best state in the nation in which to do business. I was proud to carry the Virginia Values Veterans Bill across party lines with Senator Toddy Puller and to move that through both houses and on to Governor McDonald's desk for signature. Today, 3,500 more veterans have jobs because of that. I was proud to carry, in a bipartisan way, a bill with Senator George Barker. He's my senator. I live in the 39th Senatorial District. And we were able to carry a texting bill across 
uh, the General Assembly and to Governor McDonald's desk for signature. The idea came from citizens. Paula Johnson, right here. Wave your hand, Paula. Paula is here. I'll tell you who Paula is. She lives here in Prince William County. She has two sisters that live here in Lake Ridge, I believe. Paula came to me about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and told me about her brother, Fred Peritelli, whose life was taken by an irresponsible texting driver. That put a human face on a piece of legislation. I carried it. Senator Barker carried it. We did it in a bipartisan way, and we carried it across the finish line with a lot of help from our colleagues in the House and Senate. Forty-three people, 43 delegates, both parties joined my bill as co-sponsors, and it put teeth into the bill and gave tools to those who are sworn at to protect the rest of us. Law enforcement. We've kept taxes low. We spent money on education. We have education that is very good by the measure of any yardstick. I spent a heck of a lot of time in Virginia's classrooms here in Prince William County. And so this coming January, my hope is to go back to Richmond to shepherd a robust agenda of veterans legislation, work with Toddy Puller on the next steps for the Virginia Values Veterans Program, and to carry an ethics reform bill through using best practices from the National Conference of State Legislatures. I think I've been an all-in, all-engaged delegate who has been focused and energetic. On the other hand, you do have a candidate here who is a good man, but I'll tell you, he's been disengaged, distracted, he's not been engaged in Prince William County, or better yet, I would have known him because I've engaged in every nook and cranny, cranny of our county. He ad does advocate for the D.C. agenda, more taxes, more government, more intrusion. And so with that, I thank you for the time to be here tonight, and let's go on and win an election in November. I'd like to thank my wife of uh, 40 years for uh, giving me a, a great family uh, that we did here in Virginia. She has followed me all over the world. Um, she's been, uh, she set up camp uh, on the two continents at least. Uh, we have three children, uh, wonderful children, and they're off on their own now, and uh, I'm very proud of them. My f grandfather was a school teacher, my mother was a school teacher, my wife taught nursing at George Mason, and she works with the free clinic now. My son-in-law teaches at Austin High. And my son is a college professor in Alamosa, Colorado. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't support educators. I love them. I think we need to get back to investing in our future. I think we need to realize that we have responsibilities to our children. There are decisions that we can make. My opponent says that I'm disengaged. I spent 14 years working in industry. I made my numbers for 14 straight years. I made very tough calls. I had, to, I had to pay people what they were worth, and I had to supply them with plant and equipment. I had to make very difficult trade-offs. It's the call of the world of business. And I lived in that for 14 years. And I can make those tough choices when I go to Richmond. And because I understand business, I know what we need to do if we're going to help business grow. One of my supporters is a guy named Ki-ho Kang. Ki-ho Kang is Korean. He's the son of Korean immigrants. So be mindful when you decide you're going to strike out against immigrants. Ki-ho worked in the Air Force with me, and he started his own business. It was an 8A firm. That means he paid a 30% tax rate. And Kehoe had the courage to take what was a CETA form, a CETA company, which means you have, you're selling heads, you're, you're, you're selling uh, consultants. But he wanted to build a manufacturing firm. And he did it on his own nickel. He literally set, set aside $3 million to start buying manufacturing equipment. And now that's a $20 million firm that does light manufacturing. And it's the kind of firm that we need and we want in this county. 
And Keogh had to do it on his own nickel. And that's wrong. And that's the kind of people we should give tax cuts to. The kind of tax cuts we should give are for investment in plant and equipment and capacity, and for people who have the courage to take the risk. If I didn't pay my, my, my uh, employees, they walked across the street to SAIC. That's the kind of decisions you have to make, and that's what we refuse to make in government now. I believe we really have to reform ethics. And I pledge to you that when I go to Richmond, I will accept no gifts. No gifts for me, no gifts for my family, no gifts for my wife, no gifts for my extended family. Because those are the rules that I lived under when I was in the Air Force, and I haven't forgotten them. And when you start accepting gifts, as we've seen in this state, it's corrosive. It's nothing but legalized graft and corruption. And we need to put an end to that. People should not go into politics to become wealthy. People should go into politics and serve. I believe that, and that's what I plan to do when I get to Richmond. I need your vote in November. We need to turn this ship around. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, your candidates for the 51st District.